Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're happy for you are joining us to Sunday School this morning. I know this is a little bit different than what we've been doing in the past. We've had an actual meeting where everybody's joined us. But today, um, I and Tina will be at the church at our normal time, and nobody wanted to have Sunday School any earlier. So, um, so we're just going to record our Sunday School lesson, and then um, we'll send out a link to you, or I think you can go straight to the website and um, click on something on the website. You'll be able to see it when you push it in. All the YouTube possibilities pop up down the side. But, um, but anyway, we'll get it out to you, and um, and hopefully we'll all be able to do it this way. And maybe it won't be too much longer before we can meet back in our classroom together. I hope so, because I really miss it. Me um, too. But, um, but Tina and I wanted to kind of do it together um, just because it's a little bit different, <laughs> not being able to have anybody to interact with. So, um, but just to get things started like we normally do, I'm going to just go ahead and just uh, very quickly just make mention of the prayer list. I don't really have anything different that anybody's added to it this week. Nobody's texted me with anything except for um, we can take number six off as far as waiting on baby Neely to get here because she arrived and she's perfect and she's beautiful. I know y'all yes. probably in pictures. Um, my favorite was the one that Haley posted today with Evie Wade holding her. Um, <laughs> I mean, that is precious. She's already, she said she's already trying to hog her from me. But, uh, <laughs> So anyway, I'm pretty tickled about that. Um, Tina's uh, dad did good. You want to give us an update? Just make sure. Yeah, he's he's doing well. He's up walking around and all that. So uh, the surgery went went real well. He feels good about it. So, and he feels good. You know, like I said, being able to move around and not hurt as much today. So that's good. Everything's good. Terrific. Um, I wish you would just continue to keep uh, Todd in your prayers. He really doesn't have any change in his kidney stone issue. Other than I think he may have passed a couple of tiny more specks of one. I mean, they're not, I know he hasn't passed the whole thing because of the sizes they told him that they are. So they're just breaking off, I think. But still, he's in a good bit of pain. But um, hopefully, if nothing's happened by Monday, then they're going to figure out something to do to go in and remove them. So anyway, not that I wanted to have surgery, but Wednesday will right. be four weeks and <laughs> a month is a long, long enough. Day, so. <laughs> but anyway. All right, so if anybody has anything more, that's the only thing I have update-wise, unless, Tina, somebody's contacted you about something that I don't know about this week. Um, oh, I did hear that Ms. Mayfield died. Um, you know, big house over by Jamie Burns and Kirk Hamby, the big house sits way back up off the road. Anyway, I, I think she was a professor maybe at the university. I know her husband was, I think, at one time. Anyway, I heard she passed away this week. Kind of sad. But um, Taylor did some house sitting for her at one time, and I think she's Miss Mary Hall's really, really good friend. So, okay. So we'll remember her family. Um, but that's all I have right now. So I'll just go ahead and open this up in a word of prayer. And if anybody has anything, y'all just text it to me since we can't go back and forth right now and you guys share anything new. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this day you've given us. We thank you for the beautiful weather. Oh my goodness, it's so, so warm. I felt like it was like the beach today when I was out um, just doing a little exercise this afternoon. And um, it, it definitely feels like summer's approaching. And we pray that maybe through some of this heat, it'll kill some of these germs that are going around. Maybe that'll be a, a help to some of the sicknesses too, dear God. And um, dear Lord, as we get ready to open up this time uh, for our Sunday school, I just pray dear God that you would just keep your hand on all the many prayer requests that we're mentioning to you before we start and delve into our study today, dear God. I know you know each and every situation, um, those that um, we've been able to remove that have had surgeries this week that have been successful or like sweet little baby Neely that's been born that was picture perfect, dear God. We can't say thank you enough for that. We just praise you, praise you, praise you. But we still have a lot that are still struggling, even though we've had some good reports on some of those that are still struggling, dear God. I just pray you continue to be with them and, and help them to recover. And um, especially those that have been affected by all the, the COVID-19, dear God, we want to continue to lift that up to you in every situation. And we especially want to lift up all the states as they begin to reopen and the process that goes with that, dear God, it's easy to shut things down, but the hard part is figuring the right way to reopen everything safely. And I just pray to the Lord for um, people that are making decisions, whether it's a business or a church or a social organization or summer camps or, you know, athletic teams. There are so many things that come into play from all this, dear God. And I just pray that you be with each and every person that is going to be a part of it, dear God. And just 
help them to, um, to, to seek you and your guidance, dear Lord. We also thank you for all the good things that have come from it. You've got all the extra family time and the, just the rest um, that you have provided for us, dear Lord. And, and um, the, the new perspective that you've given a lot of us, dear God, just to look at things differently and to, um, to really have, you know, those words in Thessalonians come to our attention that say to pray continually, dear God, giving thanks always um, in all circumstances, dear God. I, and I just pray that um, that would be something that we that we continue to do as we, um, you know, just look at our families and our churches and our friends and our neighbors in a different light than maybe what we've done um, in the past. Now, dear God, as we open up your word this day, I pray that your blessings upon it, that you would just speak to us what you would have us to learn from it, dear God. And we thank you once again for the opportunity of um, to, to have technology at our fingertips so that we can do this until we can meet together again in our in our groups, um, dear God, and just delve into your word together face to face. We love you. We thank you for hearing this prayer. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So we're still looking at the messy relationships. <laughs> 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 And I don't know about you, Tina, but when I was studying this, this is not a really hard lesson. I, I didn't think right. it was very hard. Um, I think it's something real easy for us to, to grasp and for us to get a hold of. And um, the title of the lesson today is Serve. And, um, and it said um, for me to ask the question to everybody, when have you received stellar service? So I'm just going to ask you, Coach Nevin, if you had a time that you can remember that you were just treated like, you know, the queen, you were just really well. Oh, yeah. Out. I, you know, I, I have lots of instances where I'm treated like the queen sometimes, but I, I think the, when I went on a cruise to Alaska mm -hmm. for two weeks, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, somebody came in and made my bed, if my clothes, you know, if, after I took off my dirty clothes that night, I could call them to come get my clothes, take it to the laundry. It came right back all pressed and nice and clean. And I, if I didn't want to go out to eat, I could just call up, you know, room service and say, Hey, I want two lobster tails and shrimp and you know just anything and everything that you could ever want would be like just brought to you and for two weeks you know I lived like that and then I got home and had to wash my own clothes and had to cook my own food and I'm like I need to go back on a cruise because I mean the service I still remember my little guy's name his name was Wyan. Wyan was he was awesome I mean he was there just Whatever you needed, you had it right at your fingertips. And uh, so when I think of Im that impeccable service, that, that may be the best right there. Okay. All right. I've never been on a cruise. I would like all that without being out where I can't see land. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it'll probably never happen. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's easy, um, you know, think of the experiences that, you know, that we've had really, really good experiences. But I think what maybe sometimes pops out in our mind even more are the really bad service experiences we've had. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, I can think of tons and tons and tons of them. You know, we just got back off our trip to Texas and that was like a fast and furious trip, you know, just doing what we needed to do to get out there. And a lot of things weren't open, but we had secured a rental car weeks ago and, um, I've talked to several people about this. So it's, it's, uh, it's a story I've already told a lot, but I'm just going to say, I had a really, we had a hard time getting the rental car <laughs> and, and I was supposed to be there like at 10 o'clock. I pulled in the parking lot at nine 55 and I got back home to my house, like at two 49. I mean, so what should have only been just a very short experience was horrible. And I got kind of tickled because I was telling Coach Holson back about it, and I don't know if you guys watched Seinfeld when it was in its heyday, but I was a big Seinfeld friend, and he sent me the little video clip uh, where Jerry and Elaine are in the airport, and they're trying to rent a car, and he goes up to the desk, you know, and they find the reservation for him, but he wanted like a midsize, and they're like, I'm sorry, but we don't have any more cars. He was like, you don't have any more cars, <laughs> but I made a reservation, and they're like, yes, I see the reservation, but we don't have any more cars, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, he said, but you took the reservation. You know what a reservation is. And she's like, yes, we know. He goes, I don't think you do. <laughs> you <know? laughs> he's like, you know, anybody can just take the reservation. The important part is holding the reservation. Right. <laughs> you know, and it was kind of like that for me. And, um, and it was crazy. I mean, just crazy. And taking the car back was almost as bad as when we tried to pick it up. I mean, it was a complete nightmare. Um, but I will say when we got to the hotel we were staying in Texas, it was in a fairly new hotel, maybe. Um, only a year old or so, somewhere in there. Um, it was called Home Two Suites, and it was by Hilton. But because of the COVID and everything, I'm telling you, there was nobody in the hotel. I mean, hardly anybody was staying there. So it was kind of crazy. And um, there was a sweet little family, I guess, that owned the hotel. But um, they had two little girls, and their little girls were riding their big wheels all in the, you know, in the lobby. <laughs> 
you know, that, that she was so excited to see people coming in. She was like, hello, will you be staying with us today? And I mean, she was like eight. I mean, you know, she was just <laughs> super cute. Can I help you with anything? How long are you <laughs> I mean, you know, she was just, she was precious. And every time we came downstairs for something, they couldn't do like the complimentary breakfast, you know, because of the COVID. You can't so, self-serve. Yeah. Right. You can't do any of that. And so they just did these little prepackaged like muffins and they even had like, you know, the bananas and the apples and the oranges. They were all individually wrapped in saran, you know, and it was in these little tiny Tupperware looking kind of things. So you could come down and get that. I was surprised they had coffee. They did have coffee out. I'm shocked. But you couldn't, there was nothing else unless it was like a bottle drink or something. And, you know, if you've ever been in a hotel where they say they have the little snack area or their, their mini um, convenience store where you can buy aspirin and stuff, you know, a two aspirin will be like five bucks. I mean, right. you know, a bottle, and Todd could only drink water. They had every other thing you could imagine, apple juice, orange juice, milk, you know, in cartons and bottles, but no bottles of water. So I had to keep going to the little convenience store to buy water. You know, like it was like four ninety nine a bottle. And I was like, wow. You know, I was like, we're gonna have to go to Walmart and get some water because this is just crazy. You know? <laughs> well, after the first day, um, they were just so sweet to us. Every time I'd come down there and I said I need to get a bottle of water, he's like, no, no, we're so. And he, they were like Asian. He was like, we're so happy you're here. It's on me. <laughs> it's on me. <laughs> That's what he'd say. Like, he just give us the water. And um, at one time, his wife came over to me and she's like, now you know that he must really be fond of y'all because. That's bank. She goes, that, that water is bank. <laughs> he would not be giving it to you. <laughs> so, so anyway, it was kind of sweet. But um, but anyway, there's all kinds of stories we hear about service. And there was a really good example in um, the beginning of our lesson today, just talking about a man that had booked a last minute trip on a very well-known airline. And he was on his way to see his, his dying grandson. And for whatever reason, the traffic was really bad and uh, it was just one dilemma after another and it was causing him to be late to the airport and he ended up being like 12 minutes um, past where he should have been, you know, at his gate at the departure time. But apparently, I guess he had called ahead to say he was running late or whatever and maybe told the story. I'm not really sure how the story trickled down. But when he got where he was supposed to be, he was shocked to find that the plane was still there waiting to depart. Um, the airline had been somehow informed, uh, like I said, of the, of the tragic situation and had passed it down from whoever he had called. It had gotten all the way to the pilot. And um, when he got there, the, the pilot was standing there waiting on him. And he said, they can't go anywhere without me. And I wasn't going anywhere without you. And, um, you know, I thought, what a great story that is, you know. And then he apologized to the man about the situation, you know, with his grandson. And, um, you know, good customer service is, uh, it, it said in here, is not about making a sale or even keeping a customer. It's about doing what is right and helping the other person. And I just thought about, um, you know, everything that everybody's been going through all these weeks now. And uh, just how many times I've heard that, that statement, this might not be what we're supposed to do, but this is the right thing to do. You know, this might be breaking a rule, but this is the right thing for us to do right now, whether it was like refunding somebody's money or, um, you know, not taking somebody's money when they should or, um, you know, just, just all kinds of different things. I'm sure are probably running through your mind right now, but I've heard that a lot. And I thought it was a great thing that good customer service is not about making a sale or even keeping the customer. It's about doing what is right and helping the other person. And today we're not talking about customers or business. Um, but we are talking about relationships and we're talking about it from a biblical perspective. And so I think that that principle, that same thing that we just said applies, um, you know, we strengthen our relationships when we help and when we serve each other and we take care of each other. And I've certainly seen a lot of that, um, you know, from the church during this time and serving is such a tangible way, um, you know, for us to show our love to others. So, um, today, as we um, start to look in the book of Galatians and kind of explore this thing, the point of today's lesson, talking about serving, um, says to seize the opportunity to serve. And, um, you know, even though we're saved by grace, um, a lot of times we, we forget about how important serving is. We think, you know, we get in our little bubble and we're taken care of. And I don't think it's something we mean to do sometimes. And it's not something that's brand new either. This was something that was going on all the way back to the days of the Galatian believers. And so, they had even gotten to the point that they had just been kind of duped into believing that all they had to do was be circumcised and obey the Mosaic law and boom, they were good to go. They were fully Christian, you know, what we got it. 
Um, and Paul, in the scripture we're looking at today, um, really set out to explain the, the, the preeminence of their faith to them, um, to talk about how important it was, um, you know, to that, that yes, we, we have a freedom, you know, when we come to know Christ, you know, it says, you know, he's the truth and the light, and when you have the truth, what the truth sets you free, but that freedom also is defined by our faithful service to others, and so it's not just a saved and done kind of thing, but there, there are some, uh, you know, some things that we should be participating in, we shouldn't just be saved and sit on our laurels. Um, so hopefully as we read and study today, then, then God's going to open our eyes and our hearts to the importance of, of what serving others means. So we're going to start off just reading verses 13 through 15 of Galatians chapter 5. And we don't have it on the screen or anything, but um, but it, hopefully you guys have your, uh, your Bibles in front of you. And maybe uh, we get new uh, literature for the month of June. So I don't know. Maybe we'll be together by then. I, I don't know what will happen. But if not, I'll, if I have to drive by, I'll bring a book to you. <laughs> but um, anyway, the verses 13 through 15 of the fifth chapter say, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So the first thing that we need to see from this passage is that we show love by serving the other person. Um, we talked just a second ago about the freedom that we receive in Christ and freedom is, is something that, um, you know, that we hunger and thirst for, especially living here in America, you know, because we know what it's like to really be free. We have freedoms that a lot of people in other countries don't ever get to experience. Um, and everybody wants to feel free, you know, but even in our Christian walk, there's so many things that can in, in, entangle us, you know, um, sin, you know, wraps its, itself around us and it grabs our feet and holds us to the ground. And, and in this fifth chapter of Galatians, Paul re, is reminding us that, that there's been a revolution, you know, like our revolution, we, you know, celebrate the 4th of July. There's been a revolution that's come through Jesus. And because of his sacrifice on the cross, um, that power of sin has been broken. And so we get to be free from that downward spiral, you know, that sin would just kind of try to suck us down in, you know, like a, kind of like a funnel cloud, you know, just pulls you down to the center. So first today, we're going to look at um, really what freedom is not. You know, our, our freedom in, in Christ, it's not a license to go back to our old way of life. It's not, you know, people say, well, you know, you did that, you know, that's one of the big arguments. I, I talk to people all the time. They're like, I'm just not so sure what I think about this being saved constantly thing. You know, once saved, always saved. Um, but I, you know, when I say that, no, I'm not so sure that I could lay my head down if I thought like you, that I was saved yeah. when I you know, laid down and I was lost when I woke up. I mean, you know, I, I can't do that for me. And I'm not saying who's right, wrong, or indifferent, but I'm saying according to the scripture, we, we can't lose that salvation. But at the same time, it's not a license, like I said, for us to just to continue in our old way of life, to live like we did before we were saved. Um, notice the word um, right there in verse um, uh, 13, where it says that, you know, we don't, it says, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. That's what it's talking about there. It's referring to that old sinful nature, the, the old way of life that we used to participate in. Um, you know, and, and even though we say, you know, we get on the new clothes, guess what? That flesh, though, is still there. <laughs> and as much as I, you know, I hate it, he, you know, it, it, the flesh is still there and living inside of us. And sometimes there are moments when I don't behave like I'm wearing the new clothes. You know, I, I don't I don't do that. And so that flesh is, is that self-absorbed. Um, side of us that grows like a cancer, you know, it just continues to go and go and go. I've got these thorns coming up in my front yard right now. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it is so terrible. And apparently heat makes them thrive some. I didn't know that. And uh, so I was reading on the internet the other day that said they may get worse through the summer um, and they may not disappear until um, the fall when it starts to get cool. And I was like, well, that is terrible. And I took my dog out earlier and the dog will not even go in the yard. I mean, he literally tiptoes around the front and gets to my neighbor's driveway and goes all the way down my neighbor's driveway, gets to the front and will pace around, do whatever he needs to do. He might do his business right at the edge by my mailbox. But then you start, I could just call him and be like, come on, phone, and he would shoot across the yard. He wouldn't even play ball with me right now in the yard. He will, he will come back up the driveway. I don't blame him. Those, those things hurt. Yeah, it's terrible. I don't blame him. Those things hurt. They are terrible right now. Terrible. So and, 
and they are just multiplying like crazy. Like I went for a run today, walked in the house. They're all in the bottom of my running shoes. So now they're getting in my carpet. So when I take the shoes off, they're getting in my socks. As soon as I finish <laughs> eating, I'm going to vacuum again for the second time today. I mean, it's, it, it's just crazy. I don't know, but they, it just is going and going and going. And that's what sand does. You know, it grows like a cancer when it's let off its leash. You know, it doesn't own us anymore, you know, because we're bought with a price by Christ, but it likes to think it does. And it likes to whisper in our ear that it does. And it likes to keep saying, yeah, do it again, you know, and Paul knew firsthand about that continual pull, you know, on our old sinful nature. Um, so with all that being said, what do you think the connection is between freedom in Christ and our command to serve? Hmm. Something to think about. I'm not going to catch Nevin on the spot and go, give me the answer. <laughs> um, but, you know, but just think about it. What is the connection between our freedom in Christ and our command to serve? You know, Paul really begins the section of his letter, like I said, just reminding the Galatians that they're called to be free. We're called to be free. And he uses two terms here to really set the limits for Christian life. The first term he uses is called. Um, you know, he reminds them that that's what they're doing. We're called to be free. Now, a lot of times we think about the word called and we go, oh, you must have a Christian vocation. God's called you to preach or he's called you to, you know, lead the music or he's called you to do this or, you know, and, and that is true. Um, that is one way and one context, uh, context in which it can be um, defined. But here, the meaning of it is, in the Greek term, is, is God's call of a person to become a Christian. Um, you know, there is a call on that. I've been reading through, um, you know, I've told y'all, um, this is, it's crazy. Since all this started, I read through the book of Acts. I read through the book of Luke. And um, now I'm in the book of John. And so um, with my morning devotions that I've been doing with the um, the staff at the church at Liberty Park. And um, today I was in John chapter 6. And um, one of the things I was reading myself was where um, it, it's a, it's, it's at the very beginning of Jesus's ministry, really. And so there's tons of things I've I read about him walking on the water, feeding the 5,000. So it's in those areas where he's, you know, just, they're just going through all those things. And then he's having a conversation here with the Pharisees um, in this sixth chapter. And when, it, when in verse 40, he actually says to them, he says, my father's will is that everyone who looks um, to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. But then when you skip down to verse 44, he says, but no one can come to the father unless the father who sent me draws them, you know? So just like you can be called into a Christian vocation or something before that happens, you're called to be a Christian. Um, that Holy Spirit tugs at your heart and you know, you know, that we call it what the age of accountability where it all starts making sense. That's when you can first feel that wooing, you know, um, and some people may not feel it till later. They may not grow it in a home where that's something that's taught to them all the time. But when your heart gets to that point and you're exposed to it, you better believe that the Holy Spirit's going to start working on that heart, you know, and he is called, it's his will what that all will come to that eternal life is what that, that said in, in John six. But you can't come to it until, you know, you answer that call. It's a personal thing. I can't answer Tina's call. I can't say as much as she's my friend and she, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I always say I don't have best friends. I just have really good friends. But if I had to say she's my really, really, really good friend. Um, <laughs> you know, and, but as, and so as much as she is that to me, you know, I can't say, Tina, if you didn't know the Lord, I, I can't say, you know, I, I, God on her behalf, I, I want her to know you. you know, it's, it's a decision, you know, Coach Niven has to make. She has to do that. It's a personal thing. And so that's what he says here. Um, you know, we're, we're called to be free. So the first calling is for us to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. He's the one who calls us to faith. And then only God has the right to define what that means, you know, in our Christian life. And the second term there he uses is when he's talking about being called, he said, we're called to be what? To be free. And that freedom is, is um, you know, like I said, it, it, it's not something that, that frees us from the slavery of the Old Testament, um, you know, and, and the law, because the law does have its purpose. But what it does is it frees us from the legalism of it, the, you know, got to check this off your list kind of thing. It, it's not to um, something that, that we just dismiss the law because it is a measuring stick and it's still very necessary for us. But, you know, but we're never going to be able to live up to the letter of it. We, we can never keep the law. I mean, I break it all the time, you know? And so if that's the measuring stick, if, the, if that's all I have to go by to have my Christianity, then I'm never going to do it. And he's saying we're free from that. You know, we're called to be free, but, but we're, we're, we also have a free freedom from that law. And because of that freedom, it, what he describes and, and tells us is that, that just because we get that break from the law, that doesn't mean we're not supposed to follow after those things, but because we can't achieve it, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, God understands, you know, I can just do what I want to, I'm saved. But that's why he's saying, don't indulge in that flesh. 
You know, that doesn't give us the freedom to, to abuse it, you know, to indulge in it, but rather that we serve one another humbly. And so the word translated here, um, serve means, um, it said to be owned by another, to be a slave. Um, so it, it, you know, we see, we have that call to use our freedom, um, in slavery to one another, to, to watch after one another, to, to build each other up, to hold each other accountable, um, to meet each other's needs, all those kinds of things. Um, and we do that through service and love. And in verse 14, after commanding the Galatians to serve one another, then Paul notes that we do, it says for the entire law, then is fulfilled. Um, and it's fulfilled in doing what? In keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now we can all go back to Leviticus 19, um, verse 18, I think, um, and, and look at that as, as a way to, you know, to fulfill the law. We can go back and remember that um, Paul kind of followed the pattern of Jesus in response to the question. Remember the scribe asking, what's the greatest commandment? And then Jesus said, what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And then he adds back to Leviticus 19, 18. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, there's no greater commandment other than these. And uh, you can read that story if you want to go back and find it in, in the book of Mark in chapter 12. But the point seems to be um, that the way to fulfill the law is not according to the flesh, you know, like they were thinking, just like I said, follow the rules, get your circumcision, do everything we're supposed to do. But by fulfilling the intent of the law, which means, you know, by, um, by loving one another through that power of, of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, and Paul had some people that kind of butted heads with him about it, you know, in Galatia, and they expressed some, some grave concern. He had dismissed the significance of fulfilling the law is what they were saying, you know, and how dare you, and what are you thinking, you know? But Paul responded that if believers are really interested in fulfilling the law, um, you know, then, then we're going to understand the importance of, 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 of carrying it out, of, of living it in our lives. Um, you know, I mean, think about, um, let's see, just think about what it says to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, think about yourself. If, um, Coach Niven, if you need food, <laughs> what are you going to do? What, what am I going to do if yeah. I need food? <laughs> yeah. Go to the grocery store. That's right. You're going to go to the grocery <laughs> store. You're going to go to the fridge or whatever. Uh, when your body right. calls out to sleep, what are you going to do? I'm going to bed. That's right. <laughs> if, if you feel like you need a little exercise, what are you going to do? I'm going to take that walk. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, and, and because we're going to take care of ourselves, right? Um, and right. the letter writer says that, that type of self-service is not necessarily bad, but Paul is challenging us not just to serve ourselves, but to serve others in that same capacity. So you said so when we're hungry and we're thinking about that food, think about somebody who doesn't have it. Um, you know, when we are tired and weary, think about how we can minister to somebody else who might be tired, whether, you know, they've had a long day with their kids or, you know, I'm thinking about this right now. Everybody's like, I need a break for my kids. <laughs> um, you know, what can I do? Um, you know, think about ways we can, can reach out and do that. When you need to exercise, ask somebody to go with you. You know, there are ways that we can pull people in. We serve our needs, but likewise, we can serve others when they have needs. And we make investment in others, you know, until it becomes a habit or a natural way of doing it. It's just our way of life. That's Christianity. Um, you know, that, that's part of it right there. And our concern for the interest of others and, and, and other believers, you know, builds up the church. Um, so well, it's, what? It's, it's no different than like, uh, you know, when I think about my teams and I try to, when I pick my teams and, you know, one of the first meetings I have with them, you know, we talk about, you know, being close knit and being there for each other. And I tell them right off the hand that the only way you can do that is if you're willing to serve each other, you got to put yourself last, put everybody else first. Right. And, you know, we'll have some great, you know, team chemistry and stuff. And, you know, the first will be last or the last will be first, excuse me. And, and you know, and I, you know, I try to preach that idea about service to them because um, especially our leaders, you know, you, you want them to be your best servers. Uh, they may be in a high position like a captain or something like that, but I expect them to be the ones that are bringing uniforms out of the locker room or cleaning up the locker room, stuff like that. You know, even though they hold a high, you know, high title or a high position, you know, I expect them to serve, you know, their teammates just like anybody else. Exactly. Um, you know, and thinking about that concern, you know, for the interest of others, it, it, like I said, it does build up, it builds up the church, but 
Um, Paul doesn't just leave it there with us. And he reads to us in that last verse that we just read in 15. If you bite and devour each other, <laughs> watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. You know, right. so that's why it's so important for us to serve each other because otherwise that simple self takes over sometimes and we, you know, go back and forth. And it said um, the terms for bite and devour were pretty rough terms here. <laughs> um, it was talking about the describing um, even something as, as serious as the attack of a snake bite or the devouring like of wild dogs that would just devour, to, you know, to death or prey, um, more or less consuming one another through, you know, whether it's gossip, spiteful discord, um, you know, just all kind of things. Um, that, and the more that happens, the weaker, you know, the, the, the body becomes. And so, um, and, you know, it destroys the fellowship, which also when outsiders are looking in, it makes us lose our, our, our witness, you know, to the world, which is already affected with, um, I thought this was interesting. It says a pandemic of sickness. Now, you know, these books are written months. Way ago, ahead of time, right? you know, so how crazy is that they use the word pandemic when we're in the middle of one, um, you know, but it says saying, you know, that in the church is just like the world being affected by a pandemic of sickness, which we all know how hard that's been for us. So imagine that in the church, if we're not serving each other and we're backbiting each other. Um, so we love by serving the other person, but we're going to look at the next verses and, and Coach Niven is going to talk to us about what does that actually mean? I mean, what are we talking about here? Coach Niven? All right. So we're going to Galatians six, one through five. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks that they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else for each one should carry their own load. So in Galatians, Paul, in Galatians 6, Paul has given us a very effective way here of using our energy and time by helping others. And he says that, you know, one of the ways that we can help each other is to, and serve each other, is by confronting um, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ in love, you know. And, you know, it starts off, it says that, um, that, you know, this, if someone is caught in a sin, you know, obviously that's, you know, it's like, you know, they're discovered in the act of, you know, of a sin that, you know, you're supposed to, to actually confront them about it. And that's kind of in, in our society, especially with our, I even see it with our kids, they don't like confronting each other. And we don't like to be confronted most of the time as humans. We don't want somebody to point out our mistakes. Mm -hmm. We, we like from the point out when we do good things or have good things, but our mistakes, you know, we don't typically seem to like that. But that's why, you know, Paul is asserting that those who were spirit filled have a responsibility to restore that person uh, when and go to them, confront them about, you know, the sin that they are, um, are, are in the act of doing or have done. But it says do it in a gentle way rather than being, you know, judgmental. You know, I'm more apt to accept somebody coming and confronting me about something they may feel I've done wrong if they do it gently than if they do it like like they're judging me about it. You know, because then I'm going to be like, who, who are you talking to, you know? Or, you know, who are you to come talk to me about, you know, about this? <laughs> but if, they come, if I know that they truly love me and have my best interest, and that's and that would be a way that I, I know that they truly, truly do when all is said and done. I might get my feelings hurt a little bit, but when you really begin to think about it, I mean, only the people who truly love you the most, you know, would come to you and confront you about, you know, a particular sin. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that was that was very big. But we have to to try to restore that person up, not. Not knock them down, you know. And we live in a society where we pick people's flaws and we just kind of pick at them, pick at them, and trying to make ourselves look better. Uh, you know, we put them down uh, to make ourselves feel better, and you know that's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, you know, we're supposed to, like I said, try to restore that person up and and bring them up. You know, it has nothing to do with making us feel better. It's our responsibility. Um, to, to try to help them out, to try to get them back on track and do what's righteous in front of, in front of God. So Paul also warns, though, that while you're doing this, we need to watch ourselves because it says you may also be tempted. 
um, you know, by this particular sin. So we're supposed to do this work of restoration with other people pretty cautiously. Um, you know, Christians are not only supposed to restore their fellow believers, um, but they're also responsible for carrying each other's burdens. And, you know, when you think of burdens, um, a lot of times we, we think of, um, or well, these burdens that he's talking about are mainly going to be things like maybe it is sin, maybe it is sickness, maybe it's, you know, a mental uh, disability, maybe, you know, it's financial hardship. There's all kind of burdens out there. Uh, that we're supposed to help each other bear. And that word burden actually refers to loads that are too heavy for somebody to bear alone. Um, so anytime you had somebody who was responsible for carrying heavy baggage, usually that was a responsibility of a slave. And, and we really are supposed to put ourselves in that position, just like a slave almost for somebody else to help them carry, you know, these burdens. Uh, like I said, the burdens, temptations to sin, unemployment, financial issues, family crisis, uh, spiritual oppressions. There's there's all kind of, the, of these burdens. We're supposed to be there for our fellow bro brothers and sisters and, uh, to help them uh, with these burdens alone, not add to the burden. A lot of times we have a tendency in our society to add to people's burdens instead of taking in some of those burdens off of them, but whether it's through gossip, um, whether it's through, you know, making, you know, comments uh, toward them that may not be particularly helpful. Um, you know, we're, we're supposed to, to, to help them out. So one of the ways you have to be able to do that, though, is, is you know, you got to think of yourself as or see yourself in the mirror as you truly are. Uh, verse three goes, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. You know, it's mainly talking about, you know, like arrogant people or if we think we're better than somebody else. It, it says, you know, if, if anyone thinks that they are something when they're not, they deceive themselves. So, you know, if we think that we're superior to everybody else, we kind of look down on them because, oh, well, they're sinning. They're doing this. They're doing that. Um, you know, and we're trying to put ourselves on a pedestal above them. We're, we're not doing our job. There's no way that we can help carry their load. Number one. I know if somebody were acting that way toward me, there's no way I would let them help carry my load no. um, because I know they'd be doing it for the wrong reason. So, you know, we have to watch ourselves, make sure that, you know, we're not taking pride in the look at me, look what I'm doing. I'm helping them out by doing this, but, you know, actually take a true look at who we really are. Because like I said, if, if we think that we're something that we're not, we're deceiving ourselves. And it says each one should test their own actions. Um, you know, this was kind of like, um, it reminded me of Jesus talking about, you know, you better take that plank out of your own eye before you try to remove a speck out of somebody else's. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to actually take a look at ourselves at when, we are tr when we're trying to look at other people and try to help them. Um, you know, we think that they've, they've sinned or they've carried this load, make sure that we're in right standing uh, before we can do that. And, you know, we shouldn't compare ourselves to, to others. Um, you know, that I shouldn't think, well, I'm better than them because, you know, I don't do this sin, I don't do this sin, I don't do this sin. So, you know, I'm a better Christian than they are, or, you know, I'm a Christian, they're not. We're not to judge and compare ourselves with one another because, you know, we're all sinners and, and I mean, we're all sinners. There's no big, small, whatever. We are all sinners. We are all the same. Just, you know, thank goodness, you know, for my own self and hopefully for, you know, everybody else in here, you know, I've accepted Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and he's taking care of that for me. He paid the price for my sins. But, um, you know, it says for each one should carry their own load. And then at the beginning it's talking about the fact that we should carry each other's burdens. So it kind of seems like it's contradicting uh, it sells there a little bit. Cause I was just like, no, what, you know, it says carry each other's burdens. Now it's saying we should carry our own load, but notice that Paul uses a different word here. I mean, you know, to begin with, he talks about the word burden and we talked about what burdens actually are. And in this word, he swaps the word over to load. So, you know, we are responsible as, as individuals for our own load. 
Um, remember, burdens are a weight that no individual could carry alone. A load would be something that you would be able to um, to carry yourself. But when we are burdened down, uh, we are to seek help from fellow believers uh, when the burdens of life threaten to to overwhelm us. And you know, it's especially you know, there's a lot of people that's been burdened uh, through this uh, pandemic. Um, you know, whether especially, you know, financially, emotionally, whether it's, you know, loneliness or depression or like I said, financially, they've, they've gone through some, some true burdens. So, you know, there are different ways to help. I think, you know, when we talk about, you know, carrying each other's burdens, we just have to make sure that we're doing it the right way, that we're doing it as an act of service uh, through God, through Jesus, who showed us how to, to, to do this service and to do it with a loving heart, do it with the right spirit, not to be shown in front of others, like I said, with bright lights, look what I've done uh, to help them out, but just, you know, kind of keeping it to ourselves and just, just helping people however that, uh, that we can. And we've got to take every opportunity that we have to, uh, to serve others because that's, that's an open, sometimes we're opening doors to be able to inter introduce people to Christ by uh, serving them. Okay. Um, well, that being said, and I think you just said it right before you kind of closed out what you were saying there, you talk about to take advantage of the opportunities that we have um, to serve each other. And, that, and that's what the last verse says in verse 10 right here of chapter six. In fact, we skip over, I think you read one through five. We don't read six and seven in our text for the lesson, but um, in verse 10, it says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So Paul here is encouraging us to seek out opportunities, you know, to serve. Um, what did the, the point of, of the lesson said, what to seize the opportunity to serve. And, um, and I think right here, um, you know, he's encouraging us to, to seek out everyone that we can. So um, if we went back and read verse seven and backed up, like I said, this is one, wasn't one of the verses that we used in the text, but um, it just goes back to um, a man. So uh, reaps what he sows. And, um, if we read that verse, then we would see how I think as Christians that we're challenged to, you know, to sow those seeds. Um, of course, we've all heard that, you know, forever and ever and ever. Um, but in verse 10, Paul really is mentioning the need for us to, to demonstrate um, that love as we sow those seeds. And he's stressing the importance of Christians to invest each, in each other. Um, you know, and notice that it is talking about Christian relationships here because those relationships inside the church are really um, when he's talking, he's holding those to a different standard, to a different level. And you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just told us to look for all these opportunities to serve. And yes, we should be serving and reaching out to those that are lost. But remember, Paul's talking to the church right here. So he's talking to, to the believer. So this, this lesson is for them. And he's saying, especially we should take care of each other. If we can't take care of each other, how are we going to go beyond the walls of the church and reach out and take care of somebody else? It's not a believer. You know, we have ties to each other. You know, it's just like family. You know, you're going to do for your family. If you can't do it for your family, what, how are you going to reach out and help somebody else? You know, so this certainly, like I said, doesn't it mean that we ignore the needs of people outside the body of Christ? Sowing those good seeds in the lives of lost people is, is extremely important. But just as a person cares for that immediate family, like I said, before he takes care of his neighbors, then we have to be sure to take care of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, this serves as a great witness to those that are outside the church because I, I can't you know, recall even on two hands, I think all the times I've heard somebody say, you know, in the years that we've been at Dogwood Grove, that, that they take care of their church family. You know, they'll take care of you. If you go there, oh, you go to Dogwood Grove? Oh, they're going to take care of you down there. I mean, you know, so that's a huge witness and testimony for our church and the world is looking at that, you know, so it's important. So, you know, while, um, um, while we look for opportunity to serve, we got to think about first looking inside our church and see what we're doing. Paul instructs the Christians to take advantage of every opportunity to do good to all people. Uh, and that does go beyond, like I said, the walls of our church. Um, but like I said, for right now, that's kind of what he was focusing on. But the Greek term for good here is, is, is different from the one um, used in, in the verses preceding that, like in, in verse nine. And here, the word term uh, good is actually talking about actions like giving, encouraging, um, helping those who are discouraged or needy or in want, you know, of something if they're, if they were, you know, poor and because Jesus went around doing good. And it said, um, you know, that's a verse that we quote a lot of times from Acts 10 38. And that term good there has the same definition, the same Greek 
um, meaning is what I just talked about with the encouragement and the lifting each other up, um, you know, and taking care of the needy. So that's the context of the word there. And so we have to consider, you know, um, what opportunities that, that we have, you know, uh, individually or as a group in our Sunday school class to serve others through our church and, and community. Um, and I'm just going to say, if you say right now you can't find a way to serve, <laughs> then you're just going to look very hard <laughs> because there are so many ways that people can help right now. I mean, it's all over the place. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and, and to think about or consider how the Holy Spirit's gifted you. Um, you know, what kind of gifts has he given you for ministry? History. Um, how can you use those gifts and those abilities that he has given you to serve and meet the needs that lie before you right now, whether it's inside our church or, or beyond the walls, you know, all that remains for us to do is just to open our hearts and eyes to the needs and the opportunities that are there. And then um, the blessed writer says to go for it because we have to act on it. We can see opportunity all day long. We can talk about it all day long with each other, but the Holy spirit and, and this scripture that we're talking about today is calling us to act on it, to go out and do something. Therefore, as we have what opportunity, let us do that good. Um, you know, so I know Tina and I kind of tag team today, you know, in our lesson, but I think it was a great way for us to talk about serving and helping each other. You know, um, I think it's a great example of what this lesson is about. Um, you know, I have a lot of things going on, a lot of responsibilities. She has a lot of things going on, a lot of responsibilities. When we're meeting in our classroom, she takes one Sunday a month for me, you know, when I'm in the children's church area. Um, but we've been working together a, a whole lot throughout all of this. We've even been so fun, yeah. We've learned to help each other with some new ways. We've learned to write some guitar music. I mean, things that we haven't had to do before, you know. And so when I was talking about us recording this lesson, I was like, you want to do this together? She was like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but but it, it was great for me, you know, because it helped me a little bit. Uh, and, and, and it was easy for me to feel like I had somebody that I was teaching instead of just talking into the computer. And um you know, and to get some input. So, you know, it could be something as simple as that. You, you, whatever your opportunity is to do good, you just got to look for it, you know, and then act on it. Like I said, it might not be something really huge, um, but there are opportunities out there for us to serve God. And so I'm going to let her um, finish talking about that as she closes us out today. You know, maybe this week we can um, think about somebody that's helped us carry a burden and we can kind of reach out to them, thank them, you know, and, you know, express our appreciation to them for helping us get through that. Uh, you know, maybe there we have a friend or a family member that's in the midst of some kind of sinful behavior or has made a bad decision. And, you know, we can ask God for wisdom and direction for the best way to, to try to uh, lovingly talk to that person about what's going on and maybe get them to, to change uh, that behavior. But, you know, that, that comes with a lot of prayer. And like I said, doing it lovingly. And then, you know, find some people that we can serve this week. You know, like I said, there's all kind of things going on right now uh, where people need help. Uh, find it even here, in our, you know, like I said, in our own church, you know, we have opportunities uh, to serve. So, you know, find, find something or someone, uh, you know, to serve uh, this week, if at all possible. So let's so live that when people think of great experiences with service, they don't think of customer service. They think of Christian service, and that is the type of service that um, is, is going to be everlasting, and that's the kind of service that, you know, we want to try to get, um, gosh, if we could get everybody to uh, to act that way, what a difference it would make in, the, in, in this world. So let's just uh, close in prayer. I hope you all have a good week, and I uh, hope we will see you uh, sometime soon. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for this lesson on service. Uh, we can't be reminded enough that, you know, service is so important that we have to put ourselves last, put everybody else first, dear Lord, and and that, you know, just live out what you have asked us and commanded us to do, loving our neighbors, uh, carrying each other's burdens, uh, carrying our own loads uh, when we're supposed to instead of putting it on somebody else. I just ask that uh, you continue to uh, be with all of our our essential workers and our healthcare officials, our leaders in our country, dear Lord, that they're making the best decisions for us during this time. I'm, I'm looking so forward uh, to our service uh, this Sunday and being able to be back together. I can't thank you enough for that. And uh, I just thank you for the opportunity that I have to serve at Dogwood Grove Baptist Church. And I ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. See y'all next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>